Good morning to you all. Good it's indeed good to be before you today. It's a wonderful thing. Yesterday, uh, Saturday the 14th, marked our 28th anniversary, that is Ellen and myself. Uh, long time. Long time. But God helped. <laughs> Are you trying to put voice in my mouth? <laughs> it may be the next year <laughs> uh, But I am indeed um, pleased to say it has been 28 wonderful years. 28 wonderful years. And I hope that God will bless us to see 28 more. Amen. Uh, 28 more. But Hasty has a good head start. I know I'm not going to catch him, but hopefully I will be able to match him. <laughs> uh, with God's help, with his help and with his strength, uh, that will happen. Uh, we'll start with icebreaker. Now i got to be careful with this icebreaker because I had one, yes, I had one uh, that I thought was real, real good, and I, I bounced it off Savannah, and Savannah, she didn't get it. I said, come on, man, you kind of get it. She said, uh, that ain't funny. And I mean, I thought it was funny. So I'm, I'm a little skeptical now as to what to do. But let's try. You all want to try? <laughs> uh, okay. This ain't the one that she, uh, I change it. I kind of listen to my kids sometimes. I change it, although I believe that it was real good. I change it. Uh, Bob uh, left work one Friday evening. And this particular Friday was a payday Friday, and instead of going home, he stayed out the entire weekend with his friends, and they were partying, and he spent his entire paycheck. When he uh, finally appeared at home on Sunday night, he was confronted by an angry wife who gave him a good piece of her mind. And she did this for two hours. Finally, she stopped her nagging and she said to him, How would you like it if you did not see me for two or three days? And Bob replied, That would be fine with me. <laughs> so Monday went by, he didn't see his wife. Tuesday and Wednesday came and went as with the same result. And on Thursday, the swelling went down just enough that he was able to see her from the corner of his left eye. <laughs> you all get that one, right? Eh? All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, I thought I was losing it here. <laughs> all right. Mm. I don't need to explain it then. <laughs> All right. Is Christ your life? Our lives are said to be in God's hand, and it is He who sustains us by His precious grace. God wounds every soul, and every soul is precious to Him. And I guess the question is how do we know this? Ezekiel tells us. In Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse number 4, he says, Behold, all souls are mine. So God made us and we belong to us. And he, we belong to him by virtue of him being our creator. It is he who gives life and takes life. Take life. Many refer to themselves uh, today as, as Christians, but their actions or their way of life tell another story. And perhaps, even perhaps today, this may be the case with some of us. We may fall into this category. And so today, this is a time for us to look inwardly and to reflect on our lives and to see what story our lives may be telling others. I'm not here today to judge anyone, but instead, I'm here today to challenge you to look inwardly, to look within yourselves, and to determine your standing with your God. The scripture tells us that Christ ought to be our life. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, we are told, For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. 
When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. According to this text, we died and we, the life that we used to live no longer should be present. We no longer exist as we were before salvation. And instead, we are told that Christ ought to be our life. So again, what is the story that your life is telling this world today? To whom do you belong? Is it God or is it Satan? There's only two choices for us to make. Either we will serve the Lord faithfully or we will serve Satan faithfully. There's no middle ground. There is no neutral spot. It is one or the other. And I know some of us, we convince ourselves that there is a sweet spot, there is a neutral spot that we can assume. But we are fooling ourselves and if we believe that there is a sweet spot, we have made a decision. It cannot be God that we are serving because there is no sweet spot. We recognize that our mouths can say anything and we can claim anything as it relates to our spirituality and our life. But the proof is not in the saying, instead the proof is in the living. Yes, and so I ask again, is Christ your life? In 1 John chapter 2 and verse number 6, the scripture tells us whoever claims to live in him must live as Christ, as Jesus did. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. We do not get to define how we will live in Christ. We do not get to set the standards. We do not get to determine the level of commitment that we will have and or the level of service that we will give. We have all been called to the same standards. We have all been called to be faithful and totally devoted to our God, to his church, and to his people. And so again, the question is, is Christ your life? If you claim to be faithful, if you claim to follow God, then Christ must be your life. And we must live as Jesus did. And there are some telltale signs by which we can make this judgment call. Notice I didn't say that I would make the judgment call. We, that is, we must look within ourselves and determine. And it is Paul who says it best when he declared in Romans chapter 6 and in verse number 16, says you are servants to whom you subject yourself well that's my little interpretation of it he said it even more eloquently he says surely you know that you have become the slaves of whomever you give yourselves to anything or anyone you follow will be your master so who do you follow who or what do you give yourself is it the way of God or is it the way of Satan? Following sin brings uh, spiritual death and separation from God. Obeying God gives us righteousness and will present us and give us eternal life. We all will be giving our lives to someone or something. We're either going to serve Christ faithfully or we're either going to serve ourselves. Or we're going to determine are we going to serve God or are we going to serve Satan. So how do we know who we are serving? Some of us say that, well, I know that I'm serving God because I was baptized. I'm a member of the Lord's church. I attend services and I, I give up my means and I try my best. But I want to tell you that you can do all these things and still not be in accord with God's will and the standards that we would have established for his people that is outlined in scriptures. Being right with God is more than just doing the externals. It is more than just observing doctrinal points and, and performing certain acts. It is more than just appearance. We can go through the motions, yet our hearts can be far from God. And so the scripture encourages us to examine ourselves, to test ourselves, to see whether we are indeed in the faith. And again, Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 13, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? 
And so there is a possibility that when we examine ourselves and if we are honest with ourselves, we may not be exactly where we think we are. And the standard for examining ourselves is God's word and God's word only. And so today there are some four questions that I want us to examine. I want us to consider these questions as we look at this question that is Christ our life. And so the first question I ask do you to, to consider is who do you obey? You can know whose you are by who you obey. What law governs your life? What standards direct your behaviors? Is it the law of least resistance? Is it the law of convenience or what is appropriate in the moment? Or whatever seems right in your eyes? Or what feels good? Certainly it's important for us to understand that there are higher laws and principles that we ought to live by. And it is not convenience or that which is expedient. It's God's law which should reign supreme in our hearts. And there's a principle above all principles and those principles are found in God's word. And I can know where my loyalty lies and whom I am by the law I choose to obey. We ought to let God's word become the law that we obey. Let his wish be our will. The Psalmist David says in Psalm chapter 1 verse number 1 through 2. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standing in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he doeth meditate day and night. If we allow God's law to reign supreme in our lives, the Bible says that those who meditate on God's law will be fruitful and they will prosper spiritually. And in verse number 3 he says, He shall be like a tree that's planted by rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And so, this is the kind of life that God has called us to live. Spiritually successful, prosperous spiritually. This is the life that is governed by those who uses God's law as the guide of their lives. And so, the first question that I want you to consider is, who do you obey? And I trust that it is God's word that we hold strictly to. The second question, who do you love? What has your affection? What gets your attention? Where is your desire? What are you passionate about? And I know in this world there's a lot of things that we can be passionate about. Some people are passionate about sports to the extent that they allow sports to extract them from coming out to service because they want to watch the ball games. Some allow people to stand in the way. Relationships. Where is your love? What's driving you? What does your love embrace? What gets your attention? In Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 37. In response to, in response to a lawyer's question concerning the greatest command in the law. Jesus said to him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And so if we love God as he commands us to love him with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, then we are on the right track. We are to love him above all others, even ourselves. John chapter 14, verse number 23. And Jesus answered him and said, If a man loves me, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. And my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If a man loves him, 
he will keep my words. No matter how difficult it may be, if we love God, we will adhere to his word, we will keep his words. God wants to be the focus of our lives. He wants to be the center of our attention. He wants to be the focus of our love, and our commitment, and our dedication. The only thing that hinders us in this area is ourselves. Nothing externally can unless we allow it to. And Paul tells us as much in Romans chapter 8, in verse number 38 and 39. He says, for he is convinced that neither death or life, nor the angels or demons, nor neither present or the future, nor powers, nor height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The only thing that can impact us is ourselves. And so the threat is not external, but instead the threat is internal. So if you want to know whose you are, check out the love factor. Who do you love? What do you love that you substitute the love of God for? What do you put in front of God? What do you put in front of your commitment and your service to God? Why are you not as active spiritually as you should be? Because there are other loves that you have in your heart. Your desire will tell you because your love and your desire will be pulling you in the direction that you are going in. And so you simply need to look and see which direction you are being pulled in at this time. What direction are you going in? Is Christ your life? Consider the question, who do you love? Another question that I want you to consider today is who do you trust? Because the one in whom we trust will suggest to us the one who we are committed to. Who do you run to in times of trouble? For many of us, we run to flowers or spas or everybody else instead of getting on our knees and running to God. So who do you trust? And there's a, well, let me leave that alone. But I just want you to be careful about who you're demonstrating, who you're putting your faith. You say, well, I want to be playing a game. Playing a game. You're showing that you have no faith in God. So who do you trust? Who do you lean on when things get tight and the pressure comes on? You know, the word trust is a multifaceted word in the Hebrew. And there are many words that is used to define trust. And trust means to put your confidence in. Trust means to find refuge in. It also means to find shelter, to find protection in, or to run towards something. So who do you run towards? Who are you running to? Who do you go to in times of trouble when the pressures come, the financial pressures and, and all the other pressures come to you? Who do you go to? Some, they go to the strong drinks. Some go to drugs. Some take the problem on themselves and they try to deal with it by themselves and on themselves and they get anxious and depressed. But if we're Christ, we should be going to our Lord and our Savior and our God. Yes, Tell your problems to God. I'm not saying don't get advice from men. We all need one another. We all could get advice, song advice from uh, from individuals but we ought to let God be our focus and so my, re my response in the times of trouble speaks volumes of the it tells the world to whom I belong and so if we belong to God we ought to trust in God in fact Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 5 says trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding he's saying you can't figure it out you can never figure it out trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding if his, if his advice is that we ought not to lead to our own understanding there must be a purpose behind that yes, you don't think the creator of all the earth knows that we cannot solve all the problems that we face 
And that's why his advice is that we ought not to lead unto our own understanding. Psalms 11 verse number 1 says, In the Lord I put my trust. Put your trust in God. Psalms 118 verse number 8 says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And a lot of times again we are very good at putting our trust and our confidence in man. It says but it's better to trust in the Lord than confidence in princes. So don't worry about man. Don't worry about those positions of authority. It is better to trust in God. And David is telling us that no matter how great the adversities that we face in our lives, we ought to trust God and we ought to lean on God. And with his assistance, we will overcome the adversities that we are facing. And so again, the question is, who do you run to in times of trouble? Yes, you get the big BC bill and they try to cut your light on. Are you going to run to Sabas or the flowers or are you going to run to God? Let us not demonstrate that we believe more in people than we believe in our God. And a lot of times we are unproductive spiritually because we have no faith, we have no trust in our God. And because we do not trust in our God, we pray and we are unproductive in our prayers. <coughs> Because that's up that's being the predominant mode that we take. Proverbs 29, verse number 25. The fear of man bringeth a snare. But those who put in his trust in Jehovah shall be safe. There's nothing to be afraid of going to God. Those who put their trust in God shall be safe. There's safety and security in God. So who do you put your confidence in? Who do you trust in? Who do you run to first? For those whose lives belong to Christ, their first response should be God. The fourth question I want you to consider is this. Am I keeping in step with the Spirit of God? Are you walking in the footsteps of the Spirit? Whose steps are you following? Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 16, if we belong to God, we should be walking in the Spirit. He says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. If we find ourselves getting going astray, it's simply because we are not walking in the Spirit. Now the Spirit is subject to us. The Spirit is not going to overwhelm us. The Spirit wants us to walk in a certain direction, but it will not push us in that direction. We must be willing to conform with the Spirit of God. So we live by the Spirit. We will be led by the Spirit. We allow ourselves to be subject to the Spirit of God. Then the Spirit of God will lead us in the right path. And then he says, And you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. As individuals, we need to be pliable. We need to be moldable and amenable. I know some of us are hard and stiff. But we need to be like this in the hands of God and His Spirit. To allow it to positively influence us. To allow it to shape us and to make us into the type of people that God wants us to be. And this is important if Christ is going to be your life. We must be willing to allow Him to shape us. In fact, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 8. It says, But now, O Lord, for thou art the Father, we are the clay, and thou art the potter. And we are all the work of thine hand. We are to allow ourselves to be molded by God through his spirit. God wants to shape us. He wants to mold us. He wants to guide us. He has not left us as orphans in this world, you know. God has equipped us to be successful in the walk that he has called us to walk in. Galatians 5 tells us that the sinful nature desires to do what is contrary to the spirit. It's important for us to understand that. That there is a nature that is going to be in us. That is going to present it to us. Desires that are contrary to the spirit. We can understand that there is a conflict between good and evil. 
But good can always prevail in our lives as we allow the Spirit of God to prevail in our lives. If we live by the Spirit, we will be successful in our spiritual walk. It's important for us to understand we cannot serve two masters. We must embrace one and reject the other. And again, some of us believe that there's a sweet spot, but there is no sweet spot. We must make a choice. We must choose between God and Satan. And if it's God, then we must be all in. Because God don't want us to be lukewarm on a half step. And if it's God, we choose. If it's, if it's the lifestyle that we choose, we choose to adopt. Then we must be consistent. We must com be committed. And we must allow ourselves to be controlled by the Spirit of God. Peter tells us, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse number 3. There's absolutely nothing else we need. He says his divine power has granted to us all things. All things means every single thing that we need. That pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who call us to his own glory and excellence. God has already done his part. He has done everything that we need. That's the next part of that equation that we must complete. We must now do our part. I guess there may be some who say, well, there's nothing for me to do because salvation is by grace. But salvation by grace doesn't mean that we don't have to do some things. Because in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 5 through 10 tells us for this very reason,